this week on The Other Side. I'm not supposed to be here tonight. Not supposed to be here. A massive show almost totally focused on the US, the Trump assassination attempt, his triumphant return to the Republican National Convention, the impending end of Joe Biden's political run, the announcement of J.D. Vance as Trump's running mate, we'll tell you all about who he is, and the conspiracy theories about the shooting and what to do with them all for now. And a revolutionary shift as a top union official backs the Republicans. All of this and more in a huge return show for our second season of 2024. This is The Other Side. G'day Sydney, g'day Perth and g'day Australia. This is episode 320 of The Other Side for the weekend commencing Friday, July 19, 2024. I'm Damien Curry, and we are back from break and what a way to come back. This is a mega show. The Other Side is the weekly show that brings you an analysis of the best bits of the news and commentary of the week that was without the woke with new episodes up every Friday night on YouTube at 7 p.m. Let's go. So, where to begin? What a week. We will get it all covered, but this is going to be a very US-centric show, that's for sure. We won't even have time to talk about the big Aussie story of the week, the CFMEU debacle. That'll have to wait until next week. But I will just say this quickly. If you didn't know that the CFMEU was one of the dodgiest unions in the land, and you didn't think that bikies and organised crime and the underbelly were probably heavily involved in being the intimidator enforcer for unions, then you've been living under a rock. So please just take every union official, every Labor politician and every lefty bureaucrat who goes on the media and tries to say, oh, gee, I didn't know there was organised crime connection in the union movement, as a complete and total liar who's taking you for a fool. OK, to America. Where to start? Well. Firstly, by saying that I think that Joe Biden is finished, not just in terms of losing the election, but in terms of even being the candidate. It may even happen before you get to watch this episode. This week, we had metaphorical crucifixion and resurrection of Donald Trump in three days between the assassination attempt last weekend and his triumphant return to the Republican National Convention for his formal appointment as the nominee for president. The convention, the RNC as they call it, also had the vote for and the announcement of J.D. Vance as Trump's vice presidential running mate. And we will be telling you all about who he is in a later part of this show. But Trump simply cannot lose the election now unless the Democrats put up a superstar celebrity candidate for president. But I'd safely put money on saying that Biden is well and truly done. And really the final nail in the coffin for Biden, in my view, was the visit that happened from the most senior Democrats in the Congress, that's America's parliament, both the Senate majority leader, Chuck Schumer, and the House minority leader, Hakeem Jeffries, have essentially told Biden to his face that he's got to go, as has California's top Democrat congressman, Adam Schiff, and now Barack Obama too. So. The Democrats are not having their national convention, the DNC, until August, until next month. But they were going to have a virtual pre-convention vote to re-nominate Biden unofficially this weekend. And oops, what do you know? Joe's suddenly got COVID. It would truly be kind of hilarious if the official reason that Joe Biden exits the race is because he got COVID in 2024. But let's see. In terms of our coverage of the big news of the week, the assassination attempt, well, Trump has bounced back so fast that it seems that we've forgotten what almost happened. And we do need to take it seriously and just pause on this for a moment. If not for a stroke of incredible good luck, or if you're religious, perhaps divine intervention, Trump would be dead. And we'd be having a very different conversation today, probably about civil war or something. So I want to start with this video just to emphasize the gravity of the moment. This is from the Australian independent videographer and vlogger, Milk Bar TV. This is so clever that it went viral globally with millions of views. 
This is a split screen, real time aligned view of Trump speaking on the right at the rally and on the left, the people who first noticed the shooter. Yeah, someone's on top of the roof. Look. There he is right there. Right there. See him? He's laying down. See him? Yeah, he's laying down. And see what I'm here to do? Fight in the right jail to get a son. What's happening? And to make sure we take back the White House, because if we do, we're going to make America better than ever before. We're going to make it. Yeah, look. And it's there he is. Because we have millions and millions of people in our country that shouldn't be here. Dangerous people. Criminals. We have criminals. We have criminals. We have people that should not be here. And it's much tougher than if it happened. We have the strongest court ever. Yeah. In recorded so history, the I, I want to play this for you in real time without editing it, because it really is quite remarkable. We are now about one minute away from the point at which the shots are fired. This is the minute where something went wrong, where there was some kind of failure of communication and a failure of action between the local police officers who were in charge of the monitoring of the outer perimeter and the Secret Service, who are responsible for the monitoring inside the perimeter and inside the venue. And they were also responsible for the monitoring of the rooftops nearby. The main problem here is that the people in the crowd spotted the shooter before the Secret Service spotted the shooter. That is the critical point to remember. That is the critical failure. Probably 20 million people. And you know, that's not the law that charge people who were sold. And if you were one of the CCP, it says, hey, what happened? Who will be turning this way? Be careful, guys. Okay, so what, what you can see on the right of the screen there is people trying to draw the authorities' attention to the people who've been shot. That's 50-year-old dad, Corey Comparatore, who was killed, and the 57 and 74-year-old men who were shot and injured. Let's go back to full sound on the tape now. We don't know if President Trump has been shot. We know he hit the ground. We do not know if President Trump has been shot. He's up. He's up. Shots are still continuing to be fired. He's giving a thumbs up, everybody. He's giving a thumbs up. Okay, so now we're going to see the moment, the exact moment that the historic clenched fist in the air photo was taken. There it is. That really is quite remarkable stuff. And the way that Nathan Livingston at Milpa TV has put this together is just incredible. Full credit to Aussie independent media. This has gone all over the world online and on mainstream TV. How much do we pay for our ABC again? <laughs> they never think of doing this. Breaking news right now. This is Vanessa Broussard. According to you live from Butler, Pennsylvania, we hear shots fired at the rally not 10 to 15 minutes after President Trump arrived. He hit the ground unheard of yet if he has been hit by gunfire Why is she secret man? service okay. quickly erupted we can see the guy down the snipers on the building behind the i, I think they hit him because the guy is it looks dead really great stuff there from milk bar tv make sure to give them a follow and a subscribe on youtube and x so there are lots and lots and lots of conspiracy theories out there designed to fit whatever political view that the person creating the theories might have. You know, it's easy to make up conspiracy theories, and I personally hate conspiracy theories. I always have. My view, having worked in large organizations, is that if you can keep a secret inside a large organization for more than two seconds, you're a genius. 
let alone between large organisations or large organisations that hate each other's guts and are riddled with politics and manipulators like, gee, I don't know, the FBI and the CIA, for example. So I take conspiracy theories of all kinds with a grain of salt, and I'm going to reserve my judgment for now. But all this stuff just doesn't add up as US Daily Wire commentator Matt Walsh summarized in a tweet late this week. Here's the apparent order of events on the day of the assassination attempt, he writes. According to the most recent reports, at 3 p.m., three hours before the shooting, Crooks raises the suspicions of the Secret Service when he tries to pass through security screening with a range finder. He's now on the radar of the security team, but they don't detain him. At around 5 p.m., an hour before the shooting, Crooks is caught on video by a rally goer wandering suspiciously around the building that he would eventually use as his perch to shoot Trump. He is not detained or questioned by security. 5.30 p.m., 40 minutes before the shooting, Crooks is photographed by security crawling around on the ground. They still do not detain him. A few minutes before the shooting, Crooks climbs on top of the building where law enforcement are staged. He is noticed and frantically pointed out by numerous rally attendees. He is not stopped or detained. 6.11 p.m., the first shot is fired. They had three hours to stop him. They knew about him and were suspicious for three hours, and they did nothing. That's Matt Walsh tweeting there. And someone else added that the timeline started even earlier in the day because Crook's parents called the police to warn them that something was wrong. And then this update from CNN's John Miller. They know that he went to his employer at the nursing home where he works as a dietary specialist before this and said, I need Saturday off. I have something important to do. We also understand that when he got to the fairgrounds where this rally was being held for Donald Trump, the first thing that puts him on the radar of security people is near the magnetometer area where they're screening people in, he's carrying in his hand a rangefinder. It's a device that looks like a small pair of binoculars, but it's used by shooters to measure the distance when they're setting up a long distance shot. The last piece is the search of the car. Um, as we reported last night, two remote controlled um, IEDs, uh, remote controlled bombs in the car. The remote control for those devices found on his person on the roof, um, according to yeah. sources. Uh, three fully loaded magazines with nearly 100 rounds, a bulletproof vest. Oh my God. So all is not right, folks. So while I hate conspiracy theories, it is definitely necessary in this day and age to be skeptical of what we read and hear online and on the mainstream media. So we will keep an eye on this. We will be slow to jump to conclusions and theories, but we will be watching carefully as this unfolds in the coming weeks. Okay, so another amazing community video that emerged after the Trump assassination attempt this week was the one showing just how close Trump came to certain death. So this very clever graphic shows what could have happened if Donald Trump had not turned his head just at the right time. Many saying that this was literally a miraculous intervention, the hand of God at play. New video also emerged late in the week of the shooter, Crooks, looking up and walking around the building that he would later use as his hill to die on. One thing that seems to be pretty clear right now in this assassination attempt, though, is that DEI and WHS had some role in nearly killing Donald Trump. That's diversity, equity and inclusion and workplace health and safety. We know this after the ridiculous comment from the head of the Secret Service, Kimberly Cheetle, that she didn't put an agent on that roof because it had a slope and because it wasn't safe. What? Firstly, who joins the Secret Service for a safe job? Isn't danger part of the gig? Secondly, we know this is a blatant lie because the other agents were on sloped roofs. This has led to massive calls for her immediate resignation. Senator Marsha Blackburn tweeted this. 
I just got off a briefing with the Secret Service and FBI. I'm appalled to learn that the Secret Service knew about a threat prior to President Trump walking on stage. I have no confidence in the leadership of Director Cheadle and believe it's in the best interest of our nation if she steps down from, our, from her position. And Fox News reporter Aisha Hasney tweeted this, Sources familiar with the Secret Service briefing with senators tells me a timeline shared with them reveals that Secret Service was aware of a threat about 10 minutes before Trump walked on stage and they still let him on stage. Well, maybe maybe if Kimberly Cheetle, whose appointment itself to the top job in the Secret Service was criticised for being a diversity hire rather than a hire based on merit alone, as any hire to such an important position should be, maybe if she was more concerned about doing her primary job than worrying about garbage like this, then the presidential candidates would be a bit safer. This video I'm going to show you was released just two weeks ago on the Secret Service's YouTube channel. Watch. Today we have a really special episode. We're celebrating Pride Month with a roundtable of Secret Service LGBTQ employees. Today we also have my co-host for the first time ever, Casey. Can you um, introduce yourself and maybe some of the people around the room to our audience? Yes, absolutely. First of all, thanks for having us. Of course. Um, I want to say... It, thank you um, for having the LGBT Special Emphasis Program and the, the members thereof to support us on with you today so that we can have some sort of celebration and education at the same time. Oh, yay. Not that there's anything wrong with that or people being LGB, but it does put a spotlight on resourcing and priorities in the Secret Service, maybe. Why can't people just leave their private lives and their sexuality at home and not bring it to work? I'm sorry, but your sexuality should not be a big part of your identity. And no, you do not need to bring your whole self to work. Just the bit that does the job will do. Thanks. It's kind of amusing, but not really. America is drowning in this DEI and ESG garbage, and it simply needs to stop. The greatest free meritocracy in the world needs to get back to being a meritocracy and not some neo-Marxist ideological radical leftist nuthouse. We need to get back to the sensible center because our lives actually depend on it, especially when the Secret Service, the police and the military start playing DEI games. Well, the Republican National Convention finished Friday afternoon our time, just a few hours before we first put this show out, with a speech from the man himself, Donald Trump, taking the stage triumphantly just days after being shot in that assassination attempt. No matter your politics, it is undeniable that this is a moment in history. Let me begin this evening by expressing my gratitude to the American people for your outpouring of love and support following the assassination attempt at my rally on Saturday. As you already know, the assassin's bullet came within a quarter of an inch of taking my life. So many people have asked me what happened. Tell us what happened, please. And therefore, I will tell you exactly what happened. And you'll never hear it from me a second time because it's actually too painful to tell. <laughs> Behind me and to the right was a large screen that was displaying a chart of border crossings under my leadership. The numbers were absolutely amazing. In order to see the chart, I started to, like this, turn to my right and was ready to begin a little bit further turn, which I'm very lucky I didn't do when I heard a loud whizzing sound and felt something hit me really, really hard on my right ear. I said to myself, wow, what was that? 
it can only be a bullet, and moved my right hand to my ear, brought it down. My hand was covered with blood, just absolutely blood all over the place. I immediately knew it was very serious that we were under attack, and in one movement proceeded to drop to the ground. Bullets were continuing to fly as very brave Secret Service agents rushed to the stage, and they really did. They rushed to the stage. I'm not supposed to be here tonight. Not supposed to be here. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Yeah. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Thank you. But I'm not. And I'll tell you. I stand before you in this arena only by the grace of Almighty God. This election should be about the issues facing our country and how to make America successful, safe, free, and great again. And we must not criminalize dissent or demonize political disagreement, which is what's been happening in our country lately at a level that nobody has ever seen before. In that spirit, the Democrat Party should immediately stop weaponizing the justice system and labeling their political opponent as an enemy of democracy. Especially since that is not true. In fact, I am the one saving democracy for the people of our country. That's Donald Trump speaking at the end of the Republican National Convention this week in the U.S. city of Milwaukee. Just a reminder that our main weekly show is available every weekend from Friday night at 7 p.m. now, Australian Eastern Standard Time. That's 7 p.m. on YouTube. We do need your help to keep going, so feel free to send us a super thanks donation. You can do that by clicking the little dollar sign thanks icon under the video frame here on YouTube. You can also follow us on X, that's Twitter, at other side sorry, the other side now, it's at the other side on X. It all helps. And if you're interested in sponsoring the other side and getting some great exposure for your business, reach out to us on Twitter or drop us an email at info at other side That's A-U-S, info at other side oz.com. <laughs> Well, another seismic shift has happened in American politics this past week, and it's not all about the horrific assassination attempt on Donald Trump. This seismic shift that happened got buried in all the other drama. What really changes everything is the fact that America's largest and most diverse union, the Teamsters Union, has more or less given a bit of a tick of approval, if not a full endorsement, of Donald Trump for president. We travel all across this country and meet with my members every week. You know what I see? An American worker being taken for granted. Workers being sold out to big banks, big tech, corporates and the elite. And I'm not the only one who sees this. Everyday families see it. The American people aren't stupid. They know the system is broken. We all know how Washington is run. Working people have no chance of winning this fight. That's why I'm here today. And I don't care about getting criticized. It's an honor to be the first Teamster in our 121 year history to address the Republican National Convention. That's the Teamsters president, Sean O'Brien, the leader of the biggest union in America, speaking historically at the Republican National Convention. And I want to be clear, at the end of the day, the Teamsters are not interested if you have a D, R, or an I next to your name. We want to know one thing. 
What are you doing to help American workers? Now, the left-wing media, the White House, the Democrats, and some of the Teamsters themselves have attacked O'Brien, calling him a traitor. But who is the real traitor? Is it a union official who stands up for workers? Or is it the modern labor movement that's for a good decade now concerned itself more with the peddling of woke DEI garbage in the workplace at the expense of the working man and working woman? Trump invited this guy to speak. And make no mistake, it's historic. It'd be like ACTU President Sally McManus going to the Liberal National Party Conference or Liberal Party Conference federally and endorsing or supporting Peter Dutton. So Trump really does understand the power of bringing people together and what this political movement we're seeing all over the Western world is really about. It's about standing up against big government and big business bullies, the elite, radical, extremist, leftist bully class. Ordinary, everyday centrist people, working class and middle class Aussies and Americans, and Brits and French and Italians, they're saying enough. And until our major parties here in Australia really get this, until the Labor Party reforms, it gets back to its roots, and the Liberal Party returns to being the party for small business, not big business and globalist corporations, well, people will continue to move away from them. Following the Trump assassination attempt, I was wondering how to present everything in this week's show. And I think one of the best things that we can do for you is present a summary and analysis of what the best non-left wing commentators in America have been saying this past week. So that's what I've spent a lot of time on. My thoughts are that this assassination attempt was the culmination of years of continuous attacks on Donald Trump that were completely out of proportion to the threat that the man poses, even if you absolutely hate him and his policies. I don't buy the argument that there's been equal attacks and bad rhetoric on both sides, that both sides are responsible for bringing down the institutions of good civil government or disgracefully abusing the criminal justice system for political gain. Nope, it's been 99% the work of one side, a corrupted and sick Democratic Party institution going all the way back to the Obama era and in some cases the Clinton era that has slowly stacked the bureaucracy, the public service in America with its people career bureaucrats in place to do the bidding of the Democratic Party and the socialist left, no matter what conventions of justice and good government that that might overturn. Yep, it's true that the more politically career-minded bureaucratic Republicans have contributed their share of deep state nonsense too. By the way, when I use the term deep state, I'm not referring to something spooky or conspiratorial, just the good old senior ranking public servant bureaucrats who instead of taking orders from the politicians who represent us, the people, and dutifully executing those orders, they like to control the politicians and give orders to them and run things their way. The deep state isn't really that deep at all. Just watch the classic British comedy, Yes, Prime Minister, to understand how it all works. So sure, the Bush era had a few of these types, but nobody has elevated it all to such a fine art as the Clinton-Obama-Biden machine of government by the elites, for the elites. And this is why Donald Trump simply must become the next president of the United States. What he's had to overcome to keep up this fight to drain the swamp is unbelievable. Because every swamp creature known to man has emerged from the depths of the swamp land and tried to take him out. Nobody listed out this week what Trump has endured since 2015 quite as well as Megyn Kelly when she was speaking with Dennis Prager on her independent media show, and Mark Levin, who was speaking on Fox News, three of the best broadcast commentators in the US, in my view. Here's Megan and Dennis first. They ruined his first term by calling him illegitimate from day one, including Hillary Clinton. They spent four years accusing him falsely of colluding with the Russians and being some mm -hmm. sort of Manchurian candidate. They impeached him over a BS phone call, accusing mm -hmm. him of doing something we would later learn the current president, Joe Biden, was effectively doing when it comes to Ukraine, according to the allegations, trading favors uh, for corrupt purposes. They impeached him a second time as he was on his way out of office. They changed the law in New York State to get him so that E. Jean Carroll could resurrect a 30-year-old claim she didn't even know she had. 
She couldn't remember the year in which he allegedly sexually assaulted her in a Bergdorf Goodman dressing room. And sure enough, she brought the case funded by Democrat activists. But wait, there's even more. They brought a nearly $500 million case against his business over some BS fraud claim that not a single bank who was allegedly defrauded complained about and shut down, essentially, the Trump operation in the state of New York. They filed a criminal indictment against a sitting former president of the United States for the first time in our nearly 250 year history for a bookkeeping error at best that he put into an accounting book that no one saw about his hush money payment to Stormy Daniels. They indicted him again down in Florida for taking presidential records that Joe Biden also took, though he'd never been president, so he was not able to declassify anything. Same offense. He didn't get charged. Trump facing charges down there. Wait, there's even more. They indicted him over January 6th. The same thing that he got impeached over, but they wouldn't actually convict him, a thing the Democrats could not let go of. That claim has now been all but gutted by the U.S. Supreme Court saying you were out of line. What happens next? He's on his way to getting the nomination. Joe Biden is infirm, as we all saw at that debate. The panic button has officially been hit on the Democratic side, and Trump has never been more of a threat. And now tonight, after calling him Hitler on newspaper magazines and in formerly respected newspapers, they sit and they say, really, he should tone down the rhetoric? Really, he should be calling for his side to behave better. You've got to be kidding me. Megan Kelly on her independent media show there. And U.S. radio and TV commentator, author and constitutional expert Mark Levin echoed that sentiment on Fox News. And then I want to say this to President Trump. Now, Brian, everybody's been on all nine days. I want to say something. God bless President Trump. He's pushed back the FBI. He's pushed back the Department of Justice. He's pushed back these DAs and attorney generals. He survived two impeachments. He survived a criminal investigation. No man should have to go through this. No man whatsoever. And I think the American people understand this completely. You know, I knew Reagan. I know a lot of very great men. I, I, this man is historic. This man is special. This man is standing up against evil on so many levels. This man has put his life on the line, his, his family on the line, his career on the line, everything on the line. And I want the American people to compare that to Joe Biden, who thinks the presidency, he deserves it. Mark Levin on Fox News there, apart from pointing out what Trump has endured, the endless attacks, and they still couldn't get him after all that ridiculous lawfare, which is now all just falling apart, by the way. Mark Levin also put the blame for the assassination attempt square at the feet of the media, the corporate media that just never stopped attacking Trump. I've always said that if you're an Australian, it's not surprising you'd think Donald Trump was Hitler or the most evil threat to democracy in a century because the media here just parrot what their US affiliates shove at them. The fact of the matter is, Donald Trump survived an assassin's bullet. God was watching over him. That's number one, Brian. Number two, lawfare is almost dead. Donald Trump has beaten a corrupt Department of Justice, a corrupt Attorney General, a corrupt DA in Manhattan. That case will be resolved properly, and a corrupt DA in Atlanta. They've tried to bankrupt him. They've tried to imprison him. They've smeared his character and his name. And I want people to remember something when they talk about J.D. Vance said these things about Trump. He's apologized. When will the media apologize? When will our Al Jazeera Pravda media apologize? They talk about what's wrong with America. Oh, there's sickos in America. The problem is there's too many of these people in the media. When will Comcast do something about Joy Reid and the lineup at MSNBC? When will Warner Brothers do something about CNN and the lineup at CNN? They have no self-reflection, no circumspection. The media have led the charge with this Hitler narrative, which is grotesque. When I listen to these reprobates in media, and they're not going away, they'll give it a week, they'll give it two weeks, three weeks. They never stop and they never will stop. This is who they are. Joe Biden's been doing this for 50 years. 
when I hear what these people say and they take no responsibility, right. not one of them has been fired by corporate media, not one of them has gone on the air and apologized, and the head of the whole operation, the man demanding that his campaign go low, attack low, look, I'm telling it as it is, I haven't been on the air for nine days. That's Joe Biden. Mark Levin on Fox News this week. Megyn Kelly and Dennis Prager agreed. These Democrats, these leftists here, they're probably two weeks away from blaming whatever happens next on Donald Trump. They're going to pull up that statement and say it was incitement and blame him for it the same way as please go peacefully and march on the Capitol got turned into falsely incitement under the law. Donald Trump is a human being. He's allowed to have a minute before he thinks about what to tell his supporters about how to behave. And you know what else? They're entitled to their anger right now. I hope they don't. I pray they don't do any return violence. I urge them not to. But they're absolutely entitled to feel enraged tonight. Dennis, I feel it too. Uh, I've been enraged for all of my lifetime about what the left has done to Western civilization or what the left did to any country it took over. Why don't people hate communism as much as Nazism? <laughs> it's the, the left has gotten a moral pass for all of its history. And uh, th this is just another example. You, you can say the man is Hitler and get away with it. You can say that uh, he, uh, he, he, inspired an insurrection we have no we don't have a right to be angry we have a moral duty that's dennis prager u.s media commentator and founder of the prager u channel u.s president joe biden gave an evening formal address from the oval office live on tv during the week much to the horror of his advisors no doubt my fellow americans I want to speak to you tonight about the need for us to lower the temperature in our politics. And to remember, while we may disagree, we are not enemies. We're neighbors, we're friends, co-workers, citizens, and most importantly, we're our fellow Americans. We must stand together. Yesterday's shooting at Donald Trump's rally in Pennsylvania calls on all of us to take a step back. Take stock of where we are, how we go forward from here. Thankfully, former Trump is not seriously injured. Yes, thankfully, former Trump is not a former Trump and is not seriously injured. This man should be in treatment and care, not the Oval Office. There is no place in America for this kind of violence, for any violence ever. Period. No exceptions. We can't allow this violence to be normalized. You know, the political record in this country has gotten very heated. It's time to cool it down. We all have a responsibility to do that. Yes, we have deeply felt strong disagreements. The stakes in this election are enormously high. I'll continue to speak out strongly for our democracy, stand up for our Constitution and the rule of law, to call for action at the ballot box, no violence on our streets. That's how democracy should work. We debate and disagree. We compare and contrast the character of the candidates the records, the issues, the agenda, the division for America. Ah, yes, the division for America. That's what Joe is all about. I'm pretty sure he meant to say the vision for America, but the Freudian slip tells all, and it gets better. The issues, the agenda, the vision for America. But in America, we resolve our difference at the battle box. You know, that's how we do it, at the battle box, not with bullets. No, the good old battle box, not the ballot box. And he said it twice, the battle box. These Freudian slips are amazing. They really are, and very telling. I feel bad for poking fun at a person who is obviously not well, but this man should be in treatment and care, not the Oval Office. You know, actually, I, I don't feel sorry for him anymore because he's put himself there. He's had plenty of opportunity to gracefully step aside now. So I'm sorry, but from now on, until you lose in November, Joe, you are fair game, dementia or no dementia, Parkinson's or not. You know, we're blessed to live in the greatest country on earth, and I believe that with every soul, every power of my being. So tonight, I'm asking every American to recommit, to make America so, make America, what, think about it. What's made America so special? 
Here in America, everyone must be treated with dignity and respect, and hate must have no safe harbor. Here in America, we need to get out of our silos where we only listen to those with whom we agree, where misinformation is rampant, where foreign actors fan the flames of our division to shape the outcomes consistent with their interests, not ours. Let's remember, here in America, while unity is the most elusive of goal goals right now, nothing is more, more important for us now than standing together. We can do this. Oh, yeah, yes we can. So it all sounds lovely, right? It's, it's the kind of left, they never do, they, they, they always say the lovely things, but you've got to watch what they do, not what they say. The patronizing tone of, of big government, the fakeness and the utter hypocrisy of it is all just too much, as Daily Wire commentator Ben Shapiro pointed out. So the walk back that we are seeing from the Biden administration, from the Biden White House, is an acknowledgement that we need to cool the rhetoric, that the rhetoric has to calm down, which of course is something that I have been saying for years in this country, is that when you declare that your political enemies are such a threat to the republic, that if they are elected, will be, say, the last election, that will be the end of America, that you and your friends are going to end up in actual jail. You're not joking about it. You actually mean that. When you say that sort of stuff, you are exacerbating political divides to the extent that somebody could take you seriously and then go attempt to shoot the president of the United States in the head, for example. Yeah. Ben Shapiro on his Daily Wire show there. So just how bad have the media been in the years that Trump has been in power and the years since? Independent and conservative media have been compiling clips of the kind of inflammatory rhetoric used by the Democratic Party and the mainstream media against Trump. Cauldron Pool assembled this little reminder. And remember, these are the same people who gladly reported the indictment of Trump for insurrection because he apparently incited the January 6th protesters to enter the Capitol building by telling them to peacefully protest. Rise. I, I, I just don't even know why there aren't uprisings all over the country, and maybe there will be. People need to start taking to the streets. This is a dictator. You know, there needs to be unrest in the streets for as long as there is unrest in our lives. Enemies of the state. Show me where it says that protests are supposed to be polite and peaceful. Do something wow. about your dad's immigration practices, you feckless. When they go low, we can... How do you resist the temptation to run up and wring her neck? Biggest terror threat in this country is white men, most of them radicalized right up to the right. I thought he should have punched him in the face. I said, even if you lost, he insulted your wife. Yes. He came down the escalator and called Mexicans rapists and murders. He said, well, what do you think I should have done? I said, I think you should have punched him in the face and then gotten out of the race. You would have been a hero. I'd like to punch him in the face. I said, if we were in high school, I'd take him behind the gym and beat the hell out of him. Punch some people in the face. When was the last time an actor assassinated a president? They're still going to have to go out and put a bullet in Donald Trump. And that's a fact. Look as his character is stabbed to death. Where is John Wilkes Booth when you need him? I have thought an awful lot about blowing up the White House. A Missouri state senator is under investigation by the Secret Service after saying she hopes President Trump is assassinated. I will go and take Trump out tonight. And if you see anybody from that cabinet in a restaurant, in a department store, at a gasoline station, you get out and you create a crowd. And you push back on them. And you tell them they're not welcome anymore, anywhere. And sadly, the domestic enemies to our voting system and wow. our honoring our Constitution are, are right at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. They're not going to stop before Election Day in November, and they're not going to stop after Election Day. And that should be, everyone should take note of that on both levels, that this isn't, they're not going to let up, and they should not. If you think we're rallying now, you ain't say nothing yet. That's the kind, compassionate side of politics, folks, the the left-wing side of politics, and they call the right-wing the crazy side. No, the left are radical extremists, and the right are now the sensible centre. It's really hideous stuff, and that compilation was put together by Calder and Poole, another Australian independent media channel, and Australia's own Sky News channel put this more recent compilation together of the recent Democrat talking point that's been delivered about Trump as an existential threat to the nation. 
he's running against a man who is an existential threat. Donald Trump is a plague on the American conscience and the American nation. And Donald Trump is an existential threat that the antidote, to whom the antidote is Joe Biden. I think that Donald Trump is the most grave threat that we will face to our, to, to face to our democracy in our lifetime. We have to make the case Donald Trump does continue to pose an existential threat to our democracy. Trump is a existential, urgent threat to our democracy. Donald Trump cannot be president again. He's an existential threat to democracy. We got to focus on the greatest threat to American democracy that we have ever seen. And that is in Donald Trump. That's the kind of rhetoric that turns the heat up. That's the insanity right there. Donald Trump is not an existential threat to democracy. Donald Trump is an existential threat to the Democrats. That's what they can't stand. That compilation from Sky News Australia. So the Democrats turn the hysteria up to 11. And then when somebody very nearly assassinates the man, they say that we need to tone down the rhetoric a little. And by we, they mean Republicans and conservatives, not themselves. It truly is astoundingly obscene hypocrisy, as Ben Shapiro noted. The people have been heating up the rhetoric to the point where there was an assassination attempt against Donald Trump, have been doing so for 10 years, and they include people like Joe Biden, who all the way back in 2011 was suggesting that Tea Partiers were terrorists, that they were akin to terrorists. He's a person who suggested that Mitt Romney wanted to put black people back in chains. Joe Biden has spent large swaths of his career engaging in the most extraordinarily radical type of rhetoric with regard to his political opponents, full-scale demonization. The message that he was attempting to purvey is a fine message. The problem is that coming from Joe Biden, who refuses to dissociate from his central campaign message, which is that his opponent is a fascist who is going to destroy the country wholesale and turn himself into a Hitlerian dictator, it rings pretty false. Yep, Ben Shapiro on his Daily Wire show there. At no point did President Biden say, and it starts with me. And his lackluster press secretary, Corinne Jean-Pierre, was typically vague and waffly when she was asked point blank about it. Does the president regret anything that he has said in the course of this campaign about uh, his Republican rival or anybody else in the political space? Does he plan to adjust his rhetoric or is it just a call for other people to make changes? So I want to just be very clear, and you know this, I've been asked about anytime there's violence, sadly, that that comes up across the country. Uh, we have, the president has always, always spoken out uh, forcefully against violence, always. Yeah, but that wasn't the question that was asked. She's pivoted to violence. The question was about President Biden's own rhetoric, the existential threat to democracy type messaging. So let's try it again, Green. We don't want to politicize this moment. We want to unite. We want to continue to focus on that. And that's what the president's going to focus on so right now. His messaging changed this week? His messaging is going to be really clear. He's going to continue to engage with the American people. That's what you're going to see uh, in the next upcoming days, upcoming weeks. Nothing different than what he's done in the last almost four years. Uh, it is uh, crucial, though. It is important that we bring the temperature down. That's what the president has said. That's what he wants to see. And, uh, you know, he's going to live through those values. And that's where you're going to see. Talk about his agenda. Highlight his agenda. That's what you'll see in the next couple of days. Go ahead, Jackie. Great. Taking another stab at the question you've answered yeah. uh, several different ways. But I guess more simply, are we going to continue to hear the president in official events or on the campaign trail use the phrase threat to democracy specifically? I want to be very clear. The president's always going to denounce violence, forcefully denounce it. He's always been against this. Yeah, we're just not going to get any kind of statement of self-reflection or humility from old Joe and his mouthpiece, Kareem. Maybe just one more shot at it. It'd be really hard to do, though if you're trying to make a shift away from what has been the, the platform of this administration, of his campaign, in, in that the view is that Trump and the MAGA Republican agenda is a threat to democracy. So how do you get that message across while bringing the temperature down? How is that phrasing going to be replaced? Is it going to be replaced? Well, look, what I can say is this. We have our differences and it's OK to have our differences. Yeah. Yeah, it's just not going to get answered. Just waffle, 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 nice sounding phrases, more nice sounding phrases, more waffle, waffle, typical left wing talk, talk, talk and no action. It's just time to give up, folks.
You can catch us here on the other side every Friday night from 7 p.m. on YouTube if you'd like to support us. The best way is to subscribe to our channel on YouTube and tell your friends about the show. Seriously, send an email to five friends for us. Uh, it is absolutely free to subscribe on YouTube, by the way. All you have to do is hit that subscribe button. And if you feel generous and you'd like to give us a donation, uh, all you have to do is press that little button uh, just below the screen frame there on YouTube where it says uh, thanks and has a little dollar sign. We would really, really appreciate your financial support so that we can keep doing what we're doing right here at the other side. At the Republican National Convention for the US presidential election, that's the big meeting of all the Republican bigwig delegates from around America to formally endorse their nominees. Donald Trump named a 39-year-old senator from the state of Ohio as his presidential running mate. James David Vance, or J.D. Vance, is a conservative member of the Republican Party, and he's become the first millennial to appear on a major party presidential ticket in the U.S. He served in the Marines straight out of school, and then he studied political science and philosophy at Ohio State University. He then went on to earn a Juris Doctor, a law degree from Yale Law School. But that's not how his life began. He grew up in poverty, surrounded by adults struggling with addiction. In 2016, he wrote a book called The Hillbilly Elegy, which became a New York Times bestseller. And in 2020, it was made into a film directed by Ron Howard and starring Amy Adams as his mother, who struggled with drug addiction, and Glenn Close as his grandmother, who helped raise him. Hasta la vista, baby. <laughs> How many times you've seen this? Oh, about a hundred. Everyone in this world is one of three kinds. Good Terminator, a bad Terminator, and neutral. You're a good Terminator. Well, I wasn't always. I had to learn. I know I could have done better, but you, you got to decide. You want to be somebody or not. You, you got to write to your own life. Don't make us your excuse, JD. Family's the only thing that means a goddamn. You'll learn it. The book came out five years before J.D. Vance went into politics in 2021. Like a lot of us, Vance was originally a critic of Donald Trump, but he later became a supporter during his presidency. I'm a never Trump guy. I never liked him. I obviously didn't fully appreciate the president's appeal in 2016. Yeah, he said some bad things about me, but that was before he knew me and then he fell in love. <laughs> so what does Vance stand for? Well, analysts say that he's an economic nationalist or economic populist. What does that mean? Well, it's not a classical liberal or libertarian approach to economics. Economic nationalists or natcons, nationalist conservatives, they call them now too, they believe that the market, the free market, should be subordinate to the state and to serve the state's best interests. Their ideology emphasizes state intervention to empower the nation over unrestricted free trade and globalization. The economy should be regulated to serve nationalist goals. So they like some protectionism, some policies like tariffs and some restrictions on labor, goods and capital movement abroad. Self-sufficiency of the nation is their main focus. So this kind of fits with the MAGA philosophy of Donald Trump very well. You deal with other countries to win. You don't deal with them for mutually beneficial outcomes like free trade advocates would argue. So free markets are good within the nation, but it's aggressive and competitive between nations. Now, what else does J.D. Vance believe? Well, he is pro-life and he is against abortion, except when a mother's life is in danger. In his voting in the Senate, he has opposed U.S. military aid for Ukraine, but he's a strong supporter of U.S. support for Israel in the current war. Just a week or so ago at the National Conservatives Conference in the United States, he said this. The American people, again, they need people who put the interests of their own citizens first, of our own citizens first. And that's what this entire movement is all about. And I think that's what the Trump presidency will be about if we give him another shot, as I expect that we will. Trump's endorsement advance sets him up for a run for the presidency in 2028 himself. 
So this is no small appointment, this VP thing. Trump could have gone for someone like Marco Rubio or Tim Scott, people who would have broadened the appeal of the ticket, what some would have argued would have been a more politically strategic approach. But instead, he went for someone who would deepen and cement the MAGA legacy into the future. Someone who will be the reformer needed. Someone who will survive Trump if, God forbid, anyone tries to take him out again. Meaning MAGA won't end with Trump, but it will be entrenched more deeply in the Republican Party. This is the opposite of a diversity pick. Both Rubio, who's Hispanic, and Tim Scott, who's African American, would have helped Trump shore up minority voters. But instead, Trump's gone with a white working class guy. But is it actually any less politically strategic? Maybe not. By going for the white working class pick, Trump will shore up the so-called Rust Belt. And it's those white working class Rust Belt states that make up the battleground states. The question is on the motion that Senator J.D. Vance be nominated by acclamation. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed signify by saying no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the motion is adopted. Without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid upon the table. Okay, so that is J.D. Vance today, the vice presidential candidate and most likely the next vice president of the U.S. But who was J.D. Vance before today? Well, you know, despite what the left try to tell people, the left and the right both care very much about people and social issues. What separates the left from the right is that the left believe in the perpetual victim. They acknowledge that people are born into tough circumstances, that we all get dealt a different hand in life, and they see the solution as big government state intervention. By treating people as perpetual victims, they can control people. You need the state to help take care of you. You need to vote for us, so we'll tax all the rich bastards and redistribute the money to you. Of course, they rarely do much redistributing. They just grow their own little empires inside the national or state bureaucracies. Socially and economically less fortunate people get stuck exactly where the left want them, in a perpetual state of dependency upon big government. The right, on the other hand, believes that the only way to rise above the hand life has dealt you, if it isn't a good one, is to make personal decisions and fight like hell. The government has a role to play in creating some equality of opportunity and social mobility, but ultimately it's up to you. It's equality of opportunity that we strive for, not equality of outcome. That the idea of the dole and other forms of welfare is to get off them as fast as possible, not stay on them for life. There's not as many votes in that idea, but it is the right one. And Donald Trump's new vice presidential candidate, J.D. Vance, did a TED talk seven years ago after his book came out at the ripe old age of 32. I want to finish this segment by playing you some of that talk, which is possibly the most inspiring and amazing thing I've heard in ages. I came from a southern Ohio steel town, and it's a town that's really struggling in a lot of ways, a ways that are indicative of the broader struggles of America's working class. Heroin has moved in, killing a lot of people, people I know. Family violence, domestic violence and divorce have torn apart families. And there's a very unique sense of pessimism that's moved in. Think about rising mortality rates in these communities and recognize that for a lot of these folks, the problems that they're seeing are actually causing rising death rates in their own communities. So there's a very real sense of struggle. Now, I had a very front row seat to that struggle. My family has been part of that struggle for a very long time. J.D. Vance grew up in a very dysfunctional poverty situation and with a mother who was often physically and emotionally absent because of drug addiction. If you had looked at my life when I was 14 years old and said, well, what's going to happen to this kid? You would have concluded that I would have struggled with what academics call upward mobility. So upward mobility is an abstract term, but it strikes at something that's very core at the heart of the American dream. It's the sense and it measures whether kids like me who grow up in poor communities are going to live a better life, whether they're going to have a chance to live uh, a materially better existence, or whether they're going to stay in the circumstances where they came from. And one of the things we've learned, unfortunately, is that upward mobility isn't as high as we'd like it to be in this country. The economic and social problems of the poor white working class in America are real, as they are for poor people of all races and backgrounds. 
And J.D. Vance explains that there is also a deep spiritual and psychological sense of hopelessness that goes along with that. There was a sense that kids had that their choices didn't matter. No matter what happened, no matter how hard they worked, no matter how hard they tried to get ahead, nothing good would happen. So that's a tough feeling to grow up around. That's a tough mindset to penetrate. And it leads sometimes to very conspiratorial places. So let's just take one political issue that's pretty hot, affirmative action. So depending on your politics, you might think that affirmative action is either a wise or an unwise way to promote diversity in the workplace or the classroom. But if you grow up in an area like this, you see affirmative action as a tool to hold people like you back. That's especially true if you're a member of the white working class. You see it as something that isn't just about good or bad policy. You see it as something that's actively conspiring, where people with political and financial power are working against you. And there are a lot of ways that you see that cons consp conspiracy against you perceived, real, but it's there and it warps expectations. J.D. Vance says kids get the sense that there's just no point in working hard because they won't ever be let in to the elite's world anyway. And there's a lack of what's called social capital, even knowing that help is available to you. He says he never knew as a kid that the way to become a lawyer was to study law. Even more tragically, he says working class poor kids are far more likely to experience childhood trauma. We know what happens to the kids who experience that life. They're more likely to do drugs, more likely to go to jail, more likely to drop out of high school. And most importantly, they're more likely to do to their children what their parents did to them. This trauma, this chaos in the home is our culture's very worst gift to our children, and it's a gift that keeps on giving. So you combine all that, the hopelessness, the despair, the cynicism about the future, the childhood trauma, the low social capital. And you begin to understand why me, at the age of 14, was ready to become just another statistic, another kid who failed to beat the odds. But J.D. Vance did beat the odds. So how? Family support. His grandparents really stepped up. They provided me a stable home stable family. They made sure that when my parents weren't able to do the things that kids need, they stepped in and filled that role. My grandma especially did two things that really mattered. One, she provided that peaceful home that allowed me to focus on homework and the things that kids should be focused on. But she was also this incredibly perceptive woman, despite not even having a middle school education. She recognized the message that my community had for me, that my choices didn't matter, that the deck was stacked against me. She once told me, JD, never be like those losers who think the deck is stacked against them. You can do anything you want to. And yet she recognized that life wasn't fair. It's hard to strike that balance, to tell a kid that life isn't fair, but also recognize and enforce in them the reality that their choices matter. But Mamma was able to strike that balance. Wow, that is it. Life isn't fair, but you must still rise above and believe in yourself and fight. Perpetual victimhood and dependence upon the government and those who would take advantage of you is not the answer. And JD says that good old fashioned discipline also helped. The other thing that really helped was the United States Marine Corps. So we think of the Marine Corps as a military outfit and of course it is. But for me, the US Marine Corps was a four year crash course in character education, taught me how to make a bed, how to do laundry, how to wake up early how to manage my finances. These are things my community didn't teach me. We need to ask questions about how we're going to give low-income kids who come from a broken home access to a loving home. We need to ask questions about how we're gonna teach low-income parents how to better interact with their children, with their partners. We need to ask questions about how we give social capital, mentorship to low-income kids who don't have it, we need to think about how we teach working class children about not just hard skills like reading, mathematics, but also soft skills like conflict resolution and financial management. Now, I don't have all of the answers. I don't know all of the solutions to this problem, but I do know this. In Southern Ohio right now, there's a kid who's anxiously awaiting their dad 
wondering whether when he comes through the door, he'll walk calmly or stumble drunkly. Here's a kid whose mom sticks a needle in her arm and passes out, and he doesn't know why she doesn't cook him dinner, and he goes to bed hungry that night. There's a kid who has no hope for the future, but desperately wants to live a better life. They just want somebody to show it to them. I don't have all the answers, but I know that if, unless our society starts asking better questions about why I was so lucky and about how to give that luck to more of our communities and our country's children, we're going to continue to have a very significant problem. J.D. Vance, the Republican U.S. vice presidential candidate for 2024, speaking at a TED talk in 2017. Inspiring stuff. And you can watch the whole thing on YouTube. Just search it up. I think this guy will make an excellent vice president, certainly a heck of a lot better than the one they have now. Well, amid all the talk this week about toning down the rhetoric and the deranged hysteria around Donald Trump, you could count on Australia's good old ABC to ignore the message and show absolutely zero capacity for self-reflection. The ABC is the organisational equivalent of a 22-year-old left-wing undergraduate student at an Australian university studying social science. They had no qualms about going right ahead and airing their latest hit piece on Donald Trump. Again, a two-part special feature affair, aren't we lucky? It's going to continue next week. Such objective journalism. Watch. If he's returned to the presidency, he's going to be dangerous. It can literally destroy our democracy. I'm not sure the country will survive it, honestly. I truly believe that we could be on the path to authoritarianism. What are you thinking when the President of the United States is enunciating this idea? Yeah, he's a fucking idiot. Mark Willis is the reporter there, and your ABC, ladies and gentlemen. What an absolute disgrace. What a total piece of rubbish this is. I am sick to death of my tax dollars being used to fund this crap. Something must be done about it. And folks, I really want to make a big clear point here about the ABC. It's not just that they are riddled with left-wing cultural bias so deeply embedded in all their coverage that they can't even see it anymore. It's that their product is actually just really, really bad quality. It is god-awful broadcast journalism. Every time we turn on the radio, the TV, and watch or listen to our ABC, the quality is just appalling. The journalism is poor, the writing is poor, the presentation is poor, and the production. Oh my god. How many cliches can they cram into one story? The shadowy dark silhouette shots, the dramatic music to fill in the fact that there's no actual content or story there. Interviews with only the people that hate Donald Trump. And right after, he was nearly murdered. How is that journalism? And they think they're all clever and artistic and hip with this new shtick of uh, showing the gaffes and the, the, the bits in between the interviews and having people introduce themselves while looking directly to the camera like this. He's somebody who doesn't like to be told the truth. <laughs> yes. I'm Leon Panetta, former chief of staff uh, to President Clinton. I mean, what is that? Like they think it's cool and so millennial. It's like something a first year film studies major would think up and they do it on many of their radio segments too. It is just so tedious. So it's not just that our ABC is deeply culturally biased and politically biased, it's just plain bad. And that would all be fine if we weren't forced to pay for it. Who's gonna be the first non-left politician in Australia to have the guts to do what Canadian opposition leader Pierre Polyev has done? and come out and announce before the election that they will radically cut the budget of the wasteful national broadcaster? The ABC's Canadian cousin, the CBC, gets $1.4 billion of Canadian taxpayers' money every year. That's actually only slightly higher than the ABC's budget, despite Canada having almost 50% more people than we do. Hmm, point to note. 
Polyev has hinted that he could cut the CBC funding by a billion dollars to just 400 million. And why not? You can still run a decent basic essential service for that easily with modern technology. Many in the Australian Liberal and National Party say, in typically gutless fashion, oh no, the, you know, the ABC is sacred. We can't say that we would cut its budget dramatically. Actually, the current ABC in the form it is now is not sacred to anyone. Just look at the ratings. The other argument you'll hear from the scaredy cats in the Liberal Party is, oh no, they'll report mean things about us if we say that we're going to cut their budget and that'll damage our campaign. Uh, newsflash guys, they already campaign against you at every election and every day in between. Wakey wakey, it's a propaganda machine for leftism and any conservative or classical liberal or libertarian party with any fortitude at all should campaign on cutting the ABC back. How many hospitals can we get for a billion dollars? I think it's about 30 to 40, isn't it? And that is all we have time for this week on The Other Side, your weekly summary of the best news and commentary without the woke. Please remember to tell your friends about the show, please. That is by far the best way to help us out. And also do please follow us on X and YouTube. And please smash the like, subscribe and bell buttons and every other button on every platform that you can. We drop a new show every Friday night on YouTube at 7 p.m. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, um, to make sure that you never miss any of our content, do hit that subscribe button, do hit the little bell because that'll notify you when we post new content and it's free. And uh, if you like what we're doing and you want to support us, click on that little dollar sign thanks button and make a super thanks donation so we can keep on delivering. I'm Damien Curry. We'll see you next week.